My name is Neil Fitzgerald, Head of Ethics and Governance for Chartered Accountants Ireland. As part of this governance webcast series, we'll be exploring a range of topical issues from board effectiveness, whistleblowing and speaking up, corporate enforcement and when it all goes wrong for companies and directors, and a range of issues impacting SMEs, charities, listed and regulated companies. Now I'm delighted to be joined by Ian Drennan, Director of the Office of Director of Corporate Enforcement, to hear his insights on key corporate governance issues in Ireland, the role of corporate enforcement, and key matters for directors' boards to be aware of in relation to recent developments in that area. One of the important functions of the ODCE is to ensure the compliance with requirements of Companies Acts. The director and his staff dispatch this role by communicating publicly the benefit of compliance with the law and the consequences of non-compliance. I'm joined by Ian Drennan, who is the Director of Corporate Enforcement and will, upon its eminent establishment, be a member of the Corporate Enforcement Authority. Previously, he served as the first Chief Executive Officer of the Irish Auditing and Accounting Supervisory Authority, one of the regulators of Chartered Accountants Ireland, of course. And an accountant by profession, Ian also holds qualifications from UCD, the Smurfit Graduate School of Business and the King's Inns. Ian, you're very welcome. Thanks, Neil. And if it's okay, Ian, I'm going to launch straight into it. Absolutely. Ian, what distinguishes the ODCE from other regulatory authorities? For example, the Central Bank of Ireland, who may investigate allegation of breaches of the Central Bank Acts and regulations. And then you have the Charities Regulator, who may be focused on Charities Acts and regulations. What distinguishes the ODCE from those? And is there ever crossover with their investigations? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I suppose the easiest way to answer that is we distinguish between what we might call a regulator and an enforcer. So a regulator um, is an entity that typically will, for example, authorise entities to conduct certain activities. So, for example, the central bank authorises firms to conduct, um, for example, deposit-taking activities. Thereafter, it may attach conditions to the way in which they operate. Uh, it'll have, a, generally speaking, an ongoing supervisory relationship. So, for example, you alluded to IASA. So IASA would have had, a, or does have, rather, a ongoing supervisory relationship with, for example, ICAI. An enforcer, on the other hand, um, is more reactive in nature, so that we don't engage in authorization, approval, uh, ongoing supervision, but rather we deal with issues that suggest non-compliance. So it's more like um, law enforcement in the true sense, if you like, indications of non-compliance come to our attention and we then investigate or take whatever enforcement action is necessary. Whereas with the former category, namely the regulators, they will have an enforcement dimension, but it's a, a subset of a larger role, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis the regulated entities. Um, so hopefully that goes some way towards answering that question. And can it arise a situation where perhaps one of the regulators can pass a case over to you for further investigation if they come across a, a breach of companies? Access? Absolutely, because all of the entities you've alluded to be the central bank or the charities regulator and so on, they're all statutory entities. And generally speaking, we have what are known as statutory gateways. So it's a legislative provision that we would have and that they would have whereby you can share information with each other. Okay. So for example, if we have occasion to investigate an entity that is a charity, which we would on occasion because charities tend to incorporate as companies. Um, contingent upon the nature of the issues involved, we may have an engagement with the charities regulator with a view to determining who might be the most appropriate entity to take the lead on a particular issue, which will depend largely on what the nature of the subject matter is. Okay, so you could, you could have a, an investigation into Charities Acts and an investigation to breach of Companies Acts, either going side by side or one, one or agency taking the lead. Correct, or I mean, you, you may have seen recently there was a, some... Uh, public coverage of um, a homeless charity that was was in the media, and, it did, yeah. and the charities regulator there uh, in that particular instance took certain um, action under the Companies Act. So that's yeah. an example of one regulator taking an action under another piece of legislation by virtue of the fact that that entity, in addition to being a charity, was also a company. It made sense. Perfect. And Ian, can I ask, as white collar crime, it often involves criminal activity outside of breaches of the Companies Acts, and I'm interested to understand where the overall oversight for an investigation resides. I mean, is it two separate files prepared for prepared for, for the DPP, or is it one file jointly prepared and presented by perhaps the ODC and Angarda Siakana? I suppose the, the best way to answer that is to sort of go back to the start. So, I mean, generally speaking, an issue will come to our attention in a number of ways. Um, and similarly, it might also come to attention, or may not, to another regulator or enforcement body at the same time. So where it becomes evident um, that it has come to the attention of more than one, uh, which will generally speak and happen because, you know, for example, if you get a complaint, the complainant will, you know, tell you that I've, invest, I've, I've lodged this complaint with X number of bodies. Once we had a preliminary look at it and get a sense of what's involved, if necessary, at that point, then we will engage with the other regulator or regulators with a view to 
making a preliminary assessment as to who might be best placed to proceed with it because generally speaking it doesn't make any sense for two or three regulatory, regulatory or enforcement bodies to be duplicating effort and to carrying out the same investigative work. So for example if it was something that suggested to us there was a significant tax dimension we would for example make contact with revenue discuss the matter with them with a view to trying to assess whether it might be best for them to take it forward or us. And we do, though, notwithstanding that we have a significant, very uh, significant um, statutory duty of confidentiality, we have what are known as statutory gateways, whereby we can share information with certain other specified entities with a view to uh, just you know, forwarding issues like this where discussing it with them would be uh, relevant to their functions. And then, depending on who takes it forward, we generally speak and determine whether it may not ever may not ever result in a file going to the GPP because it depends on whether the indications involved are suggestive of criminality or not. But if they are, for example, then generally speaking, the file will be prepared by whoever's taken the lead on the investigation. So, for example, is that if that's us, then it'll okay, be us. Okay, so it sounds like there's a fair amount of GPP. coordination and uh, discussion before actually an investigation commences as to who... A absolutely, on an ongoing basis, uh, there would be with multiple regulators, but not just at the beginning, but, but during the course of an investigation thereafter, if necessary, there would be ongoing dialogue, yeah. And I know we'll touch on it later on, Ian, but with the, with the upcoming Corporate Enforcement Act, um, the, co the creation of the Corporate Enforcement Authority, excuse me, um, do you expect a new regime will result in greater efficiencies or faster timeframes for concluding investigations? Is it designed to, to achieve that? Well, I suppose, first and foremost, it was designed to give us a greater degree of operational flexibility. Um, so one of the most significant changes from an office to an agency that, that the risk of boring your members um, is that one is quite different in the way it's formulated to another. So for example, the agency will have a much greater degree of flexibility around recruitment. And in the nature of the business that we do, no more than any other professional business, you know, having a significant level of control over your own resources and recruitment is very significant. So now in addition to that, uh, government have also conferred upon us additional resources, both of a civilian variety and additional members of Angarda Siakana, both of which will assist us to do more in terms of you know do more in terms of the investigations that we could be doing because as you have to there's an opportunity cost obviously with every investigation of you take course. on yeah. um, but also hopefully to um, expedite certain of them but expediting them only gets you so far in terms of <clears throat> we only have control over the investigative process once it gets into the court system clearly we have no control or indeed before that once yeah. once a file goes to the DPP it's entirely a matter for them yeah. uh, how long it'll take them to adjudicate upon it okay. I mean, companies, company directors and their advisors may well believe the less they know about corporate enforcement, the better. Um, but this might suggest they're staying on the right side of compliance with the Companies Acts. However, there's more to the ODC's strategy than investigating breaches of the Companies Acts. Can you pro please provide us with a brief overview of the ODC's other work? Sure. I just Before I do, if I just go back to the first question, though. Sure. So if you take, for example, your the central bank, for example, they will have an engagement with every single regulated entity by virtue of the fact that you have to make an application to be authorised and there will be an, an authorization process. In contrast, companies when they, or people when they choose to incorporate a company go to the company's registration office, that happens yes. completely out of visibility to us. So we would have no engagement with the vast majority of companies and the vast majority of company directors. Um, if they incorporate, if they file their returns with the CRO and so on, if they you know, uh, carry out the, the, the various discharge, the various obligations that fall upon them, they'll have no involvement with us at all. So what we have an involvement with is, is the very small cohort of companies that have either done something wrong or a complaint has been made in respect of them, or we've received a statutory report in respect of them. We can talk about that later, um, so that they will come to our attention. And thereafter then, um, as we said earlier on, we'll, we'll investigate in the normal course. But as you rightly say, that's only one element of what we do. We do a whole range of other things, one of which um, is what we call our advocacy remit which is whereby we have a statutory, uh, one of our statutory functions is to encourage compliance with company law, uh, which is, this is a manifestation of that. Yes. Yeah. Plus the publication of various booklets that we make available, either in our copy or our website, plus various other um, documents and periodicals that we would issue from time to time, yeah. where we try to get the message out there that um, as those who've been through the process mostly will attest to, at the end of the day, it's cheaper just to be compliant in the first instance because Absolutely. being on the receiving end of an investigation is a very expensive process. Yes, and, 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 and not just in terms of cost, in, in terms of mental anguish as well that can cause all parties. And actually, that's a very important point you meant, meant, mentioned at the start of that in, in the context that the ODC does not have any sort of authorisation role. Some people might believe that because you're a director of a company, you have in some way been approved. You're self-selecting, really. You fill in the forms, you file them with the CRO, and hey, presto, you're a director. 
Absolutely, it's entirely self, uh, entirely self-selecting, but very importantly, and it's very important not to not to oversee this or to 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 miss this by way of oversight. Is that you know on those forms that you complete, mm-hmm. you are asked to you know to, to acknowledge that you're taking on the responsibilities of a director, mm-hmm. and it's no different to the way I look at it. Is no different to being given a driver's license. Yeah. You know, you're you're being put in charge of a vehicle that can do very significant damage. Yeah. And thereafter, it's important that you know the rules and regulations that attach to that privilege. And that's a very good analogy because that's what the ODC produced some fantastic guidance and, and, and booklets actually on what are your duties as a director. And they're not a bad one-stop shop to actually just get, get an appreciation. Much easier read, I think Ian, you'll agree with me, than actually reading the company's acts in its entirety. <laughs> Indeed. And I mean, it's a very difficult balance to strike yeah. because, you know, the, the company's acts are like, that thick yes it's and only get bigger (laughs) and only get bigger and it's very dense technical legalistic language that is impenetrable to the average man or woman if you like so what we try to do is to distill that into something that's manageable but at the same time try and not make it so simplistic that it's of no value and that 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 can be a very difficult balance um but the one thing that we can't do obviously is give advice because we're independent in the nature of our of our statutory functions but we do try and whether we work with other entities yourself and and you know educational bodies and, and various other entities that represent directors trying to either reach current directors or those that might be directors of the future. Yeah. And with an eye on prevention, can you tell me a little bit about the main sources of the ODC's investigative activities? What are the main issues causing Absolutely. Well, the, 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 source, the, the primary sources of our information is first and foremost there are a number of professional cohorts of professionals that have obligations to report. So as you'll be aware, auditors, if during the course of conducting an audit, identify indications that have been suggestive of an offence being committed or an indictable offence rather they have an obligation to make a report to us okay similarly every liquidator is appointed to an insolvent company i one that's unable to pay its debts uh, at the time that it's gone into liquidation is required to make a report to us um in in the case of the auditor they're required to give us details about the base upon which they formed that opinion that there may have been a the commission of a defense the liquidator is required amongst other things to report on his or her analysis as to what were the primary drivers or reasons for the insolvency. Examiners are required to submit their reports to us. And then in addition to that, a huge cohort of what we would get then would be from the public complaints. And that can range from the company has failed to hold an AGM right up to protected disclosures on, on potentially very, very significant issues. And then within that, you can have breaches that are alleged breaches that are civil in nature, alleged breaches that are criminal in nature. Uh, and then we will triage those and then we will deal with them depending upon the seriousness that attaches to each of the issues. And Ian, just, just to give us a sense, I mean, you, you mentioned there about the auditors reporting to the ODC. These are the in, for, for, aforementioned uh, indictable offences. Yeah, yeah. Are there many of those? Um, They've come down significantly. I mean, the primary reason, well, sorry, there was two reasons. I mean, initially, you know, I was back in, back in the early days of that, we were being snowed under with those because that was because auditors had to report if, a, if, a, if an annual return hadn't been filed or been filed late because they were their offences. So that was carved out in due course, which was significantly reduced. Because the CRO would be picking that up anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And then thereafter, you know, as, as audit exemption limits have increased and have companies have more and more moved out of the audit net, if you like, naturally commensurate with that um, trend, the number of, of uh, reports has reduced. And then as we've done, you know, we've done a significant number of work, or a bit of work or, over the years on things like director's loans, where in the early days, directors would have been largely ignorant of their obligations and, and the provisions around that which are quite technical in nature and as that you know made its way through the system and as auditors were then able to go back and to advise their clients and so on that has moved away so they're they're, they're a, i won't say they're dwindling but they're much lower in nature these days and will statutory auditors continue to have responsibilities to report certain offenses under the new regime the the corporate enforcement yeah there's, there's no change no to that change. statutory provision yeah okay yeah. And are those responsibilities in relation to suspicions or are they only required in relation to evidence-based facts? Or the... It, the, the, um, the, 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 the evidence point, if you like, is that the, requ- it, it, the, audit, the report is triggered when the auditor forms an opinion during the course or during the course of by virtue of the, the audit okay. that there's evidence to suggest of an offence. So if the auditor doesn't form that opinion, then there's no need to report. No need to report. And we would have had a lot of yeah. tic-tacking with the Institute back in the day and the other accountancy bodies around yes. Where does the inflection point lie, and you know yeah. at what point? And you know, back in the early days, auditors would have um, taken legal advice on those issues because naturally enough, they're concerned about um, exposure and what have you. But that's very well bedded down at this stage. It is, yeah, and it's a bit more certain as well than the yeah. anti-money laundering legislation, which is which is a cause for a suspicion rather yeah, than exactly, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, very good. And Ian, can I ask then, just moving away from the auditors and looking at the directors? To what extent can individual directors be separately held accountable rather than the collective board of directors? breaches of companies acts well now um <laughs> well 
a, a company can commit an offence under company law. Yes. Um, an individual can commit an offence under company law, but a board of directors can't. Okay. So when we look at an issue, um, if the evidence is suggestive of an offence, I think what's very important for directors to understand is that, for example, comp- a company has an obligation to maintain proper accounting records. Yes. But a company is an inanimate object and therefore can't do that. So the, the enforceability mechanism under company law is what we call the officer in default provision, whereby it'll say that if, if you, Neil, are a director of a company and that company fails to comply with an obligation, then if you have been, if you can be shown to have been in default by negligence or some other act, act or omission, then you can be held legally responsible at law, at criminal law. So generally speaking, we don't, we don't typically tend to prosecute companies because the dissuasive effect is quite minimal. Right. You can't... Uh, prosecute a board of directors because it, it's not a, a legal entity but generally speaking we prosecute individuals and how do you pick which individuals well that'll depend on the facts and circumstances i mean we sorry to be clear we don't pick people oh, of course you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> if someone against whom a criminal charge i'll blame him <laughs> no no but uh, the evidence will uh point you in the direction of if there has been a breach yeah. And then the evidence in turn will, well, you know, what is the nature of the breach? Was there an officer in default provision or not? Okay. Now, generally, a lot of, you know, for a lot of what we prosecute are things like, for example, fraudulent trading. Yes. That's not something where you've been prosecuted under an officer in default provision. That's something where the evidence suggests you have run a business for the purpose of defrauding somebody. Mm. So the evidence will, generally speaking, be documentary. It'll be, you know, banking records. It'll be emails, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not a question of deciding. The evidence takes you where... I understand. Uh, you know, okay. and depending on the evidence then. And the parties involved. Yeah, and then we'll put it, the, the, the way the process works is we'll compile the evidence, we'll put a file together, we'll yeah. make certain recommendations to the DPP, but thereafter it's a matter for them to decide against whom charges might be directed and what those charges might be. And we, we will, you know, we will recommend charges that they might choose not to direct and similarly they may add charges to the indictment that we haven't recommended because they've looked at it and taken advice on it and they've seen a different angle to it. Very good. Corporate governance reform is on the global agenda, Ian. Uh, it's evidenced by discussions we could say at the G20 in relation to the Pandora Papers and anti-money laundering. It's evidenced at an EU level with uh, current proposals in relation to corporate directors' duties and audit reform, and also the UK, which recently published corporate governance and audit reform proposals, including the establishment of a new regulatory body, Audit Reporting and Governance Authority. Ireland's not immune to reform. And there are proposals to replace the ODCE with an independent statutory body to be known as, as we mentioned earlier on, the Corporate Enforcement Authority. What will this mean for corporate enforcement in Ireland going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you rightly say, there is a huge amount happening both domestically and internationally. The, the CEA or the Corporate Enforcement Authority, I mean, that, that has been in gestation for some, for some time. And the, the, the previous bill uh, fell because um, the, the doll was dissolved at the time. But as I said earlier, its primary purpose is to confer a greater degree of flexibility on what was the ODCE, to give it a greater degree of nimbleness and agility in terms of being able to respond to the issues that arise and also to confer it with additional resources. Now, I mean, as, as, as you'll be aware, in addition to that, there have been other developments around the Hamilton report and so on, yes. um, which you know deal with the broader uh, area of what we might loosely call white collar crime, a lot of which does feed into and is informed by some of the issues you've referenced in yeah, at EU level or further afield. Ian, you've given us a lot of useful insights. Thank you very much for that. Can I ask you one final question? We all have an interest in stamping out white collar crime. So outside the responsibility of statutory auditors, we've dealt with that, what role would you expect of the cohort we're speaking to here, qualified accountants working in any capacity, whether they're working in a business or whether they're uh, advising a business to have them reporting to the Corporate Enforcement Authority? Well, I think accountants um, play a unique role in that, um, you know, they're a highly respected profession, the ver- but by virtue of their qualification, they find themselves in all fields of work, be that in the public sector, be that in listed companies, be that as directors of SMEs, be that as advisors. So they permeate every aspect of the economy and as they, they occupy a, a very significant and, and influential role. And therefore, in addition to, and the vast majority do act with the highest degrees of integrity, um, but to bring that, I suppose, to bring that level of integrity and professionalism with everything that you do. And because the most important thing, I think, what it comes back to is when we, the investigations we look at, irrespective of the nature of them, they, ultimately most of them will come down to the same thing, which is culture or a lack thereof or a poor culture. Mm-hmm. And if you're sitting around a board table and you're bringing your particular professional background with you and, you know, we have a training in ethics that is yeah. perhaps better than, yeah, I would say probably better than most professions, um, 
you know, you bring that with you. And, and, and I would think as, as a professional, as a self-respecting professional, you should bring that to bear every day, irrespective of what walk of life you're working in. Yeah, well, I'm clearly going to agree with you on that basis. A code of ethics is actually an essential ingredient in order for something to be defined as a profession. It's built on a foundation of mm. ethics, um, and, and, and that's certainly what us accountants are aspiring to in terms of acting in the public interest. Ian Drennan, Director of Corporate Enforcement, thank you very much. Soon to be the Corporate Enforcement Authority. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for watching this governance webcast production by Chartered Accountants Ireland. You will find more useful resources on our Governance Resource Centre at www.charteredaccountants.ie forward slash governance. The Resource Centre is regularly updated with events, guides, articles, corporate governance news and contains links to other useful resources, for example, technical updates or the latest on sustainability via our technical or sustainability hubs. Make sure you're signed up to the weekly Chartered Accountants Ireland e-newsletter and stay tuned for the next Governance Webcast production. Thank you very much.